Hey everyone, my name is Rich Rosenblatt and I'm a general dentist in the town of Lake Forest, which is about 30 miles north of the city of Chicago. And I'm really excited to be here today to talk about 3M's new chairside zirconia and to give you some tips and tricks on how to utilize it properly in your practice. So let's get into the presentation and see what this new block is all about. So zirconia is kind of a, a you know, it's beyond a buzzword at this point because so many people are using it. When I started doing dentistry in 1997, and even before, my dad is a dentist, so uh, I worked as a dental assistant there, everybody did porcelain fused to metal crowns, PFMs were it. So we didn't have um, high strength, no metal type of materials like zirconia. So uh, when, when the labs were doing most of their restorations, that's what they were doing, porcelain fused to metal. That was that, was that or, or gold. So within the last say 10 years, 15 years or so, you've really started to see the rise of zirconia and metal free restorations sort of take over the market where we are right now. So you can see here, um, there's lots of labs out there right now that were obviously doing PFMs 10 or 15 years ago. They're not even doing porcelain fused to metal crowns in their labs anymore. So here's something from the, from the lab guys, the LMT people, that just shows you that the most popular milling materials in the labs, 97% of the materials milled in labs are zirconia. So that's a pretty impressive number when you start thinking about um, how, much, uh, how much they're doing in, in their labs. It, it's, a, it's a very large part of those laboratories. So let's talk about why zirconia is so popular then. Your, your preps need less occlusal reduction, so that's a big thing for, for dentists. I will say that if you ask your laboratory what one of the biggest issues that they have with cases coming into their labs, the universal number that I tend to hear from their labs is about 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent of their doctors that submit cases under reduce their preps for the materials that are being asked for. So it's a, it's a major problem. And zirconia lets us sort of overcome that a lot by being able to be a very high strength ceramic or a high strength material that we can not be so aggressive or when, we, when we reduce materials. So you're using less axial reduction so your margins can be thinner so we don't have to use uh, big chamfer margins anymore. The flexural strength of these materials there's a lot of different types of zirconia out there from the aesthetic zirconia to the higher strength zirconia that some of you are used to. And it depends and it ranges, but you're looking anywhere from 650 megapascals all the way up to 1100 megapascals and sometimes even more. So super strong crowns that we can use in our mouth, both now even in the anterior for some of the aesthetic zirconias and also in the posterior for the high strength zirconias that we have. Uh, very accurate marginal integrity. For those of you using zirconia, you know when you get those back how beautiful they fit. And there's been, uh, this I was just looking through trying to find some good articles and back in the Journal of Prosthodontics uh, research in 2011, they talked about the marginal integrity that they measured was 44.2 microns. So very, very accurate uh, restorations that we're seeing that are being delivered to our practices. There is much improved anatomy in these restorations. They're milled restorations, so we're milling them in a milling unit. And zirconia, and we'll show you later, I got some blocks next to me here, and you'll be able to see during this presentation what, what these look like. The blocks are, are milled out about 23% bigger than when we put them in the mouth. So because they're so large and the burrs that we use, we can really get into that anatomy and the tiny little carbide burrs make beautiful anatomy on these restorations. So very improved uh, anatomy over some of the milled options that we have in the ceramics. Uh, they're very cost effective. The, the blocks themselves uh, on the chair side, they, I've seen them as low as about $18 a block, which is pretty inexpensive. I've seen bridge blocks for under $40. So when you're talking about a three unit bridge that you wanna do chair side, uh, relatively inexpensive. If you wanna send it to your lab and just mill and just scan your impressions and send it to a laboratory to let them do it, I mean, you see uh, options all the time at laboratories that we get in our dental magazines for $69, $79 a unit. And when you send them digital, you even get a discount because there's not a modeling fee for you. So very inexpensive to be able to do zirconia in our practice. 
And the big thing for a lot of doctors is you can cement it. I've been teaching CEREC for at least 14 years now. And one of the biggest problems that I tend to see over the years is just the struggle that dentists have uh, doing adhesive dentistry from time to time. And it really is, it can be a pain. So being able to conventionally cement these restorations with resin modified glass ionomer is a big advantage for the general dental population because there's a lot less chance for uh, error and sensitivity and things like that. So uh, lots of reasons why zirconia has become so popular. So thankfully, 3M decided that they were gonna come out with a chair side zirconia option. And that it's, it's being a chair side user in the dental world, the material side of things has been the most exciting part for us because basically when I started 16 years ago, we had some, a couple of ceramic block options to choose from and that was it. And I put it on first molars and second molars and you learned how much you had to prep to make sure they didn't break. And uh, you, you, know, you, you dreamed of having something high strength like this to be able to put in that gave you a little bit more leeway when you just didn't have the room to prepare. So our new, the new zirconia that 3M has now come out with, uh, they give us the uh, studies that show they have over 800 megapascals of strength. So it allows for single unit use, or, so here's our single unit block, you can see the taller blocks over there for the three unit bridges, so we can do both. We can have a minimum wall thickness of 0.8 millimeters, so we do not need very thick walls on these restorations to be able to deliver that high strength ceramic that we're looking for. The firing time on these restorations is anywhere between 19 and 22 minutes. According to 3M, if you, your restoration is less than 1.2 millimeters around the entire circumference and occlusal aspect of the crown, then you'll get a 19 minute firing time. I've been using the zirconia for a bit and I will tell you that I tend to find that the, the firing time, the sintering time for these materials tends to be in the 22 minute range. As a chair side user, when you can factor in not having to do a try-in, and then we're cementing in the restorations most of the time instead of bonding, that little extra firing time is uh, made up and then some by the fact that we don't have to do the try-in, and we'll talk about that later, and also um, we don't have to worry about bonding. The cementation process is much, much faster. They offer eight aesthetic shades, so we have our standard shades and a, a bleach shade, which you'll see in this presentation later, all the way to your darker shades. So we have a lot of options to be able to use in our practices. And again, these can be conventionally cemented or they can be bonded in. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to do both and uh, make, try to make it a little bit easier for you at the end of this lecture. We'll talk about some tics, tips and tricks on cleanup to try to make life a little bit easier on the cleanup side of things. So let's talk about prep recommendations. I was um, on the uh, Spear website and I saw this photo by uh, Bob Winter and he talked about uh, the prep on the first molar, it's a, uh, it's prepped for an Emacs crown and on the, prep, on the one behind it, it's the basically the prep, the prep necessary for a zirconia crown. And you can really see here the difference in the necessary amount of, of reduction that you need in some of these areas. Since this was done, I believe Emacs has come out and let everybody realize that you can, you can prep down and use one millimeter uh, bonded uh, across the board on their restorations. But, but when you're talking about trying to cement a restoration, you cannot cement a restoration with only one millimeter of reduction and a one mil millimeter of material thickness. So we really get an advantage when we're looking to, to be a little bit more conservative in our preps to be able to cement these in this way. So you're looking for one to one millimeter, uh, one millimeter to 1.5 millimeters of reduction through the central fissure. So that's really important for that, that uh, proper thickness so we can get that occlusal load and not fracture these. We have 1, 1 to 1.5 millimeters of reduction over those functional cusps. You're gonna have 0.8 millimeter uh, chamfer margin is what we're looking for. And you're looking for about a six to eight degree taper of your axial walls. Now I'll say that uh, the incidence of debonding on 
zirconia restorations can be a little higher because I believe that people who do these chair side restorations and their bonding tend to sort of over uh, angulate those walls a little bit so that taper is more in the 15 to 20 degree range and you're certainly not going to get as much uh, resistance and retention form when you're cementing. So if you plan on cementing, just be aware of the act of the angulation of your walls, of those axial walls, to try to have some good retention and you want your, you know, your three millimeters of ferrule to really improve the lifetime that that's gonna be bonded on there. I also get some questions about uh, retraction and hemostasis when we're prepping. So what I tend to do in my office the most is I tend to use retraction cord, and then I'll use a anything that doesn't have the iron, the ferric-based aspect of the, uh, the ingredients because that's going to a lot of times stain your margin. So I like to use anything that has uh, the aluminum uh, ingredients in it. So I use Viscostat Clear when I want to soak some cord and pack it into a, uh, a sulcus to try to pull that tissue away. What I like to use a lot is one of my favorite things that I have in, in regards to hemostasis is 3M retraction paste. I love the little compule that it comes in and that small little needle nose tip that's on there allows me to get that 3M retraction paste pretty much anywhere I want and stops bleeding very quickly. A lot of times what I'll find is that when I do my preparations in my practice, I'll throw some 3M retraction paste in the prep. I'll use a copper cap, which you can see below on that retraction paste. And I just have the patient bite down on it while I run and do a hygiene exam or something like that. And by the time I come back, you'll see here in a little bit, the tissue looks magnificent. And you can even pack a cord into that. Sometimes I'll even throw some 3M retraction paste and pack a cord around there and, and then just come on back. And then if you pull that cord, you'll see how beautiful that tissue looks. So here's a case that I did in my practice where I placed in that 3M retraction paste and then I, the, the cord was packed into that. You can see on the lingual that I have the cord sort of sticking out of the lingual there so I can pull it in a bit. And I just had the patient bite on a compra cap to sort of smoosh that down a little bit for me and allow it to help with a little compression. And then when I rinse it, the other thing I love about the retraction paste is it rinses so wonderfully. So you can see here, it rinses so nice off of the prep on this case. And I just grab that little tab and you'll be able to see how nicely the margins look on this to be able to take your images, whether you're gonna be scanning it for the lab or you're going to be doing it chair side, either you or your lab tech will have an easy time trying to find these margins when you can see tissue that looks like that. So I'm a big fan of using uh, those types of methods to get me the, this type of retraction. The chair side zirconia that uh, is being launched, when you're a CEREC user, you're milling it in our MCXL. This is what we call our dry mill. And we'll talk about the ability to mill dry versus wet and what that means for everybody. So we have our milling unit we have that little, looks like an iPad screen, and then we have our, our little oven on the side, the speed fire. These three are connected together, so when we mill our restoration, the information on that restoration is actually transferred to the speed fire electronically, so we don't have to program anything. So when the, when the machine is finished imaging, or finished milling, and we open up the hood after it transfers properly, the patient's information and the material you're going to be using will be on that iPad there, and you'll be able to see exactly, making sure you'll know the time that you're going to mill, and all you have to do is hit a little arrow, the machine, the, the, the oven will sort of drop down, you'll place your zirconia restoration on top of it, you'll put it occlusal side down, and then you'll basically hit the arrow to start, and 22 minutes later, you'll have a, a really beautiful looking crown. So let's talk a little bit about when we are doing chair side zirconia, what some of the options are. So we have the ability to dry mill, we have the ability to wet mill, and then we have the ability to grind zirconia. So let's talk about what the difference is. So the dry mill does not use any water. So when we choose the dry milling uh, aspect, and we do that by the, the there's certain burrs that we, we dry mill with, um, it will go ahead and we'll, we'll, we'll dry mill the restoration and it will allow the machine, because we're not getting any water absorbed into that pre-sintered zirconia, it will sinter about 10 minutes faster. So 
I have a dry mill in my practice. This is a very similar photo of the one that I have in my practice. And I love having my dry mill because it does speed up the restoration. And if you're doing, you know, two or three zirconia crowns in a day, that adds 30 minutes of time to my day to be doing something else on, a pa on another patient or this patient. So, so I really, I, I like to try to save time where I can. So I, I, I really love having that dry mill. The wet milling that we have uses water. So it goes through a 10 minute drying cycle before it gets pushed up into the, uh, when it, while it gets pushed up into the, into the hood here. So, and people will ask, well, why can this oven sinter so quickly compared to what the laboratories have? And what you'll notice is how small this oven is. It's very similar to sort of a convection oven where you can basically fit as many as, as the, the maximum, about three restorations in here. So when you place the restorations in there, there's such a small amount of area where that heat is going that we're able to center these things a, little, a lot quicker than what can be done in the bigger units that are uh, lab-based. So in this case, we're talking about when we wet mill this, we'll let that dry, we'll dry out that, that wet uh, pre-sintered zirconia, and then it will run through the cycle. So if we're at 22 minutes for the 3M in a dry mill, we're probably looking at about an extra 10 minutes if we, uh, we need to wet mill it. Why would you wet mill? Some milling units are a little bit older and they could be converted into being able to mill zirconia. And so when we, uh, but they did not have the ability to, to dry mill them. They still had only the, the ability to do wet because it was an original, uh, original milling unit. Grinding is where we don't use carbides at all. We use carbides to mill. Grinding, we use diamond burrs. So that's, what, that's gonna be the difference. You'll get a lot nicer anatomy by doing the wet milling versus doing the grinding option. So I've gotten questions in the past about what happens when you wet mill a zirconia. And when you're wet milling a, zir a zirconia on our, on our speed fire ovens, we have a self-contained tank that kind of recirculates the, the water that goes in and, uh, and, and cools down the burrs and rinses off all of the ceramics that we're milling. So what I find is that if you're not changing your tank and if your water tank gets contaminated with water that has a silica-based ceramic in it, the translucency of the zirconia that we're using, this translucent zirconia that, that uh, we're using uh, with 3M, it's going to look a lot more opaque. So uh, I'm going to strongly recommend using an additional tank just for zirconia. So when you're milling zirconia, it's just the zirconia dust that's in there and it's not any of that silica-based dust. And you can see here at the bottom, this is courtesy of, uh, of Mike Scramstead, showing what happens when you dry mill one, when you wet mill one in the center with a clean water tank, and then what happens to the, to the opacity when you use some of that uh, water with the silica remnants in it. So I would strongly recommend ordering your second tank and just having that one labeled for zirconia and only using that. It will, it will save you a lot of, of aggravation when you're trying to get these nice shade matches and, and, the, and the opacity issue happens to you. So we had some earlier zirconias and you can see what happens when you're seeing like the early zirconias out there and they can get a little bit, uh, a little bit opaque, some of, the, some of the original zirconia. So, you know, I heard people using the phrase, uh, oh, it's like uh, white gold was something we would tell our patients. We want a strong restoration. This is kind of white gold. But you know, if you got it in an area where a patient smiled and they were these opaque type of a crowns, like something like that or, or a crown like this one, they really stood out and didn't blend in very well when we were uh, trying to make you know, some aesthetic options for our patients. So we used an option that where if we were gonna use gold, it, that certainly would stick out. So we had something that was you know, tooth colored, but just a more opaque than some of us wanted. So, so then we will, we'll talk a little bit about, um, as we're getting ready to start doing these, when you're trying to figure out what type of burrs you wanna use, Sorona puts out together a really nice chart that will tell you when you're milling certain burrs. It labels the, the diamond burrs one through three and the uh, zirconia, uh, the carbide burrs are labeled uh, four, five, and six, I believe. It's, you'll be able to see this when you take a look and look up close. And every material that we mill, 
will have the burr combination on here. So if you're confused at which burrs to use, they'll make it really easy for you to let you know while you're milling if you want to um, uh, if you want to use a diamond burr, if you want to use your um, your carbide burrs. When we're getting ready to mill these restorations, we have to enter a barcode. So you'll be able to see here on the, this is a single unit block that we have here. And on the single unit block, we have a barcode or some numbers. So uh, there is a scanner that some of the milling units have that you can actually just scan uh, the barcode and it will automatically enter that for you. We also have these numbers. So you can enter the numbers uh, from your keypad Onto the, onto the milling unit here. So you can see on the milling unit, we at that little box there, we entered in the acquisition, the, the, the barcode there. Or on your milling unit itself, this is my, uh, my MCXL, my dry mill. It actually has the same keypad, the same numbers up there. And you can just, you can hit start from your operatory, walk into the back and you can just place in the numbers chair side or mill side and just hit that little green check mark and you're ready to go. Now, a little tip for everybody. If you're going to do zirconia and we're trying to do these restorations in a timely fashion, so we're always looking to figure out a way to cut back time. One of the things you'll find if you regular mill these restorations, they regular mill in about 16 or so minutes, 18 minutes, somewhere around there. If you fast mill them, they're gonna tell you it's gonna take 16 minutes, but it'll take an, a, about 10 minutes. And I'll, and I'll show you that in a quick little video here in a second. But what I want you to realize is you can't automatically just fast mill these restorations. You need to have the proper, uh, a proper setting in your, in your CEREC parameters in order to allow the material to be fast milled. So, if you take a look in, we have these, this screen for our zirconia, uh, for our parameters, and you'll notice here at the bottom where it says margin thickness, you need to make your margin thickness 100 microns. That's imperative if you want to be able to fast mill these. So, and the reason I tell everyone to just set your parameter at this is if you have it at a, at a parameter, say like 70, and you decide you wanna fast mill and you go back and change the parameter, all of the work that you did on your restoration will be just restarted. It reproposes the crown. So we don't wanna see all the hard work we did making that crown look really nice, change the margin thickness, and the next thing we know we have to cry a little bit because we're watching that thing be reproposed and now we're spending an extra few minutes trying to redesign that. So I just tell everybody, set your parameters just in general to 100 microns on margin thickness and you'll never have to worry about uh, fast milling. You'll always have that option. So we'll put the zirconia block into the milling unit and you can see this is a four motor mill in the CEREC MCXL. So with the four motor mill, you'll notice there's, there's carbide burrs and there's diamond burrs. So depending on what we told the machine to do, if we chose milling, then it will use the carbide burrs. If we chose grinding, then it would choose the diamond burrs. In this case, we chose, um, we chose milling. And you'll see here, I just took a quick video uh, to show the, the machine now is putting the block in the back and it wants to make sure that we're, we have put the block in properly and seated it all the way. So you'll see these, these the burrs, they'll touch to make sure that we have it in the proper position, that uh, again, it's seated all the way down and it's measuring the block to confirm all of those seating positions uh, within the mill chamber here. So it'll go back around. And this process, I would say, takes in the realm of, you know, a minute to a minute and 30 seconds of time. So, and then once it goes, the, the timer gets started. And you'll see, and I took a little video here because you can see on my unit here that the actual time is about 16 minutes where it gives me my actual time. So what I did was I had my watch on me and I just clicked the stopwatch function on my watch. And so you'll see here in a second, I'm gonna pop up my watch and I'm about four seconds in and we're about 15 minutes and 45 seconds. And I am going to follow the mill and see when I finish, when the machine tells me I milled for 16 minutes, 
Was it actually 16 minutes? The times aren't always true, and it's to our benefit, actually, and you'll see that here in a second. So here we're getting towards the, I'll, I'll kind of show you the milling process a little bit when you dry mill. You can see here that we have our, uh, the, we have the thicker burr that is basically doing all of the gross reduction on the mill here. So as we're looking at the mill, the, uh, the diamond burr or the, um, not the diamond burr, I'm sorry, the um, carbide burr is just doing a lot of this gross reduction and it, it goes really fast. For those of you that have not worked with zirconia before, it kind of looks like chalk once it starts being uh, uh, milled or ground. So you'll see here, we'll finish, the, that, that burr will continue to do the gross anatomy here. So that big wide burr does a lot of the, the heavy lifting here. So it's gonna go ahead and start milling in all of the, the anatomy that we have uh, chosen or designed for this restoration. And then it flips around at some point in time in the milling process and it will use the thin burr, and the thin burr starts doing all that fine anatomy that we talked about. So when we place these in, the, the, the anatomy on these zirconia restorations looks so nice because it, it, that, that tip on there is so thin that we can get this really pretty enhanced anatomy for us. So here you can see, I'll take a little video of the actual time. So we have about 19 or 18 seconds left. And you'll see here, I was having a little struggle trying to get my watch to be able to be seen. So I have to turn it on and pull my sleeve up a little bit here. But you'll see, I'm at 10 minutes and eight seconds when the machine's gone for 16 already. So, so you're looking at about 10 minutes to 10 minutes and 30 seconds of actual time. So that's pretty quick when we're fast milling a zirconia to be able to get a final restoration. And you'll see here, it says forwarding restoration to Ceric speed fire. So right now, in this case, you would notice that you don't wanna pick up, you never wanna open the lid. This is a really important tip here. Never open the lid of your, of your milling unit until the machine tells you that the job has been completed and it takes probably about 15 seconds from this point. It will bring over all the information to the speed fire and you'll see the speed fire will come up again with the patient's name, the material that we're using and the firing time generally is what, what pops up. So once it gets to that, you can open up the rest, the hood of the milling unit and you can unscrew it and it's ready to go. So that's the nice thing about having it interconnected is that we, it controls all of the firing. We don't have to pick programs. It does all of the work for us. So you'll see here I'm about, I have one of these long screwdrivers and we'll, we'll remove the restoration. Now you'll notice in this case, the restoration has not been dropped onto the pad similar to the way it's done when we're using ceramics. So here's the restoration. It's still attached to the block. And the reason being is, I told you, that material is like chalk. It's very, very brittle. So with it being so brittle, from the distance that it would fall from the block to the pad that you see there on the bottom, most likely the restoration would fracture. That's how soft this material can be when not handled properly. So unlike our ceramic blocks, which in our hybrid blocks, which fall to the ground no problem or fall to the bottom of the milling unit, this case, we don't have to, um, we have to actually remove the sprue ourselves. So I'm gonna show you a way to sort of be careful because we don't wanna gouge the restoration and ruin our margin or make some un, uh, undue marks into the restoration with a burr. So let's talk about what we do. So I use this burr. Uh, we, I have a kit, the Seric Doctors uh, lab kit that we use and it has polishing burrs in it. It also has uh, diamond burrs and all kinds of things that we can use, contouring burrs for temporaries, all kinds of stuff. So what I tend to do is I take a very thin diamond burr like the one you're looking at here, and I'm going to take that diamond burr on a straight lab handpiece, and I'm trying to do everything I can to go into the block rather than go anywhere too close to the, the in this case, the buckle of this restoration here. So I'm gonna use, I'm gonna hold the burr. You, you'll notice I have like a couple of paper towels almost to act like a pillow. Uh, you can actually use something soft like a pillow or something that over it because when it falls, you just want it to fall and, and uh, not bounce on anything where you might get a little chip. 
So in this case, I have a paper towel down there and I'm almost trying to, to grasp the bottom of the block. So when it falls, sometimes I can just literally catch it in my fingers. So you'll see here, I take that thin diamond burr and I'm going, first I, I, I wanna make sure, sometimes I can't see the sprue because there's a lot of dust in there. So I just take an air canister and I blow off some of that zirconia dust. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, that straight diamond burr that I just showed you and I'm gonna place it into that straight handpiece and I'm going to basically grab the block and I'm going to start drilling as far into the block at, towards the edge of that sprue that I can. So there's that burr again. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna, we're gonna try to go right in that area there. So let me pop it into the, uh, into the straight hand piece itself. We'll go ahead and we're gonna grab the uh, restoration so I can kind of get my fingers underneath it so sometimes I can catch it. And you'll see, I'm kind of just leaning into the block rather than into the restoration. And I'm, I, I, a lot of times I'll go from the side and make sort of a nice indentation and I'll come over the top of the sprue. And I just wanna sort of make a groove where eventually it'll just fall off just like it did. So once that's done, I will pick up the restoration and you'll be able to see the sprue on that restoration there. So you can see how it sticks out some. And now what we need to do is polish that sprue off of the restoration. So let's talk about how we address the sprue and then how we can go ahead and get this thing um, into the oven and we can even pre-polish the restoration. So this is, a, this is a different case than the one you just saw here with um, some, some uh, different tools that I use to remove the sprue. Now what I do is a lot of times I'll use that either a very similar burr to the one I used to, to, to take it off of the block. I'll just take and I'll use the side of that diamond burr and I'll just make sure that I'm not going anywhere near the margin. And all I wanna do is sweep over the restoration very gently and I wanna take it down so I don't see the height of that sprue sticking out anymore. So you'll see, so I'm kind of brushing through with some gentle brush strokes. And then I'll take like a, a big, broad, sort of like a heatless stone. And you'll see the heatless stone here in a second. And I'll, I'll place that in and use the side of that heatless stone, which you'll see here, to just try to smooth out any irregularities that we may have gotten from the thinner from the thinner burr. So we're just going ahead and we're, we're sweeping through, trying to make sure that all of those potential marks are going to be gone. And then we'll, we'll kind of use that almost like pre-polishing, I'm um, pre-pre-polishing the block, so to speak. So now, this is back with that original restoration that I was using. Once I get most of that sprue off, I'll actually use some polishing burrs. This is a, a, a polishing burr from, uh, I believe Meisinger has this one. And this one comes in the serikdoctors.com lab kit that we, uh, that we do. And a lot of times I'll just use a polishing burr just because it'll give me a nice finish over that and taking out some of those lines. So you'll see here, we're just going around the edge with this little nice little polishing burr. And we're gonna get this, the, the residual remnants of this restoration just really good and smooth. So we're, we're going all around in all directions. And at the end of the, this, which takes maybe 30 to 40 seconds, all we wanna see is a nice uh, even flow to the, to the outside wall of that restoration. And then once we have that, we can start our pre-polishing process. I personally like to use the Meisinger Luster, their extra oral twist polishers. Uh, I, I like the fact that they're relatively soft. The kit that you're looking at here, the green is their coarse, the blue is their medium, their pink is their fine, and their yellow is their extra fine polisher. And it has some flex to the edges of those polishers, so you can get really nicely into the anatomy of those restorations. And I just find that because they're a little softer, they don't gouge the restoration as I'm trying to pre-polish. So you'll see here, here's the green coarse polisher. So once I've removed that sprue, and I'm pretty happy with the way it looks, this is gonna take out all of those surface scratches all the way around the perimeter of this restoration. So I'm just going to go around the periphery here, grab that coarse twist polisher, and I'm just gonna start to use this to give me a really, this is what I consider sort of, uh, you know, really pre-finishing or pre-polishing the restoration. We just wanna get rid of any kind of scratches. So that's what we're doing. So I'm just working my way around. Be careful that you're not too aggressive in those contact areas because these contacts are pretty spot on and we don't wanna lose 
the, um, the, the contacts. So a lot of times I'll try to be super gentle in those areas and I'll work on the contacts a little bit more once it's out of the speed fire. So you'll see here these, the, this can get nicely into those grooves and give me what I need to start to get all of those little bit of lines that I don't want in there. Next, we'll move to the blue polisher. So you'll see the blue polisher here. So here's the, the medium twist blue. So we'll take it after we've finished with the green and we're just gonna do the same thing. And it's gonna be like Groundhog Day here. We're gonna go ahead and we're going to uh, first work with, we're gonna now, you'll, if you, uh, when you're looking at this live, you'll start to see almost a little bit of bright, not brightening, but, but a shininess to this chalk look to it as you're working with the, when you get to the medium and then when you get to the fine. And it, it really starts to get uh, a nice kind of luster to it, like a, a chalk, the chalk has like a, a brightness to it or a, a, a shine. And with that, um, when you throw it in the oven, when we're done with all of these different twist polishers, it comes out a lot of times, sometimes I can get it where I don't even need to do any post work on this. Now what you'll see here is, um, as I'm working on this, this is our fine twist polisher. So again, it'll start getting more and more uh, shiny in the chalk phase. I'm gonna show a little picture in a bit when I have this restoration sitting next to the final product when it comes out of the oven. And you'll notice I'm working on this right now. This is not going to be tried in in the patient's mouth. It's 23% bigger. There's, there's no way we could get it into the mouth. And if we did, number one, it would get wet, so we'd be in the longer sintering time. And number two, if the patient tried to bite on it, they'd break it. So we go, the, the, what's always incredible to me is how they know how much to shrink this stuff. It, it's, it, it, it looks so arbitrarily large, and the next thing you know, it comes out of the oven and it looks perfect. So we're on our final burr here, our final twist polisher, and this is the extra fine. So again, we're walking through the extra fine twist polisher. We've gone through the first three. And again, each one of these is about 30 seconds of time. Because this is so soft, it will tend to polish up pretty darn nicely as we're uh, working our way through, just in this state alone. So, so you see here, so I'll walk through this last little bit and then we're gonna go ahead and we'll get ready to place it into the speed fire. So once you're done doing all of the polishing, you're going to have this polishing dust and you're gonna have zirconia dust. Now, when I bought my practice, my lab does not have air uh, built in where I can kind of just use compressed air. So I just buy these keyboard cans that to dust off your keyboard and I use that in my lab to make sure all of the debris is removed from the restoration. So you wanna get in there and make sure that you're blowing off all of that, let me go back here, you're blowing off all of that zirconia dust that, and all of the, um, the polishing paste dust. What you'll find is that if you leave that zirconia dust, especially on the intaglio of the crown, the crown, it's going, that's going to center into the intaglio so when you go to seat it, you're not gonna get a proper seat of the restoration. It's gonna hold up on those little dust particles. So you wanna make sure it's super clean. So you'll go ahead and air dry it and then I recommend getting these, these brushes, these, there's, this is a sharp little brush that you get in there and you really dust out the inside of that crown, outside too, to make sure that the, the, the fit is intimate on the intaglio and that there's no granulation on the top that gets centered in that's going to affect the bite. So I make sure I get in there real good and do that. And then once that's done, I'll air dust it one more time and we're ready to put it in the oven. So here's our speed fire. And what you'll see here is uh, the, the speed fire is open. It'll tell you that what the sintering time is going to be on this one, which is 22 minutes and 30 seconds, I believe. And we just hit that arrow in the bottom right corner on the little touchpad, and the speed fire raises up. And now when the speed fire, that will go for the distance, and then you'll see that speed fire come down. And this thing comes out a glowing uh, orange. It looks like a meteor coming out of there. And then when you put them together, you'll be able to see, once the sintering's completed, how much that shrinkage is, and it's significant. So you'll see here, 
You can see on the left, that's the restoration before we placed it in the oven, obviously, that's the white. And on the right, I have not touched it yet since um, when, it came out of the, uh, when it came out of the mill. So that's what it's going to look like when it comes out sintered in the, um, and you pre-polish. Now, if you would like to go and take that polish to a little bit of a higher luster, you can go ahead, oh, there's another one, there's a picture there that'll come out. So we wanna go ahead and we wanna, we wanna kind of enhance that a little bit. What I find, or what I've been kind of trying to test, and this is just anecdotal for me, I find that if I work with these polishing burrs before I start, and I can get this pre-polished or you know almost finished polished look to it, when, when I go to t just put a, a fine polisher on this and then some, some Robinson brushes, the, the porcelain or the zirconia doesn't turn that opal look that polished zirconia tends to, to get. When you start polishing zirconia out of the oven, you'll see in a lot of the zirconias that are out there, when you start to polish them to, uh, you know, extensively, they get a very opal kind of, uh, of, a, of a translucency or a look to them. And so it's, it won't always match what the other teeth look like on the surface. So this torch tends to cut that opal aspect down. So what I did was when I get that, that restoration, I just grabbed my pink one, and I quickly go over the restoration, and it polishes up really fast because it's already pretty much done. So we just flip it around, and at this point, I'm not worried about my contact being um, obliterated with these. So I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm going to uh, get into the occlusal grooves, make sure my interproximal contacts are good, and then from here, I'll flip it to the, um, the yellow pre-polisher. So we'll get the yellow pre-polisher now, same thing and we'll do this with the yellow. So I don't have to show the whole video, but you'll, you get the idea. You just really wanna go over all the surfaces, get those nice and shiny, and you can really see the luster that's popping up on this now. Now, a lot of times what I'll do after that, just to make sure I get all of the dust stuff out of there, is I'll just take a, a Robinson brush and then a little either chamois cloth or a dry brush, and I'll just get into those occlusal grooves like here and just to try to really get them kind of jumping out of the eye here. So, so I like to go in there, use that. I'll even go into the interproximals a little bit. Just get, it'll, it'll make the, the restoration even give it a really nice glazed look to it, which you know, is when you're sitting next to a tooth that looks nice and shiny, you, you, you definitely want it to match like that. So you'll see here in this case that we did on this patient, um, the, the back tooth was a shade C1, and then I put up a C1 shade tab just to show you that clinically, we have something that doesn't, that's certainly not opaque, it's got a nice sort of translucent look to it, and it's relatively close to that C1 shade tab. So I, I was thrilled to be able to see, I find that Cs are really hard to match, and in this patient's mouth, it tends to just fall into um, the arch form very, very nicely. So I was really, really ecstatic with, with this result. And this was one of the earlier cases that, we had, that I had done when I got to use this zirconia. Uh, let's talk about cementing zirconia. As we talked about earlier in the presentation, we have the ability to, to use resin modified glass ionomer and we don't have to bond at all, or we can use a self-adhesive resin cement like Unisem 2. So depending on what you wanna use is really up to you. I think to me, let's talk a little bit about what I would do where and why. So we'll talk about some of the important aspects of it. The, the first thing that you need to know is resin modified glass ionomer is probably one of the most popular cements out there. If you wanna use that, you need to use a retentive, you need to, to prep a retentive prep. So you need some ferrule on there from the margin to the top of your prep on the buckle and lingual because we need to be able to, to make sure that stays on there. And uh, you gotta make sure that you don't diverge those or converge those preps too much. You want them about an eight degree taper. So get some retentive preps in there or you're gonna notice that doing your resin modified glass ionomer, you're going to pop these off. So when you're using Reliex Unisem, Unisem 2, uh, the, self, the self adhesive resins, um, you have to remove the phosphates from the salivary contaminants from the restoration after you try it in. So obviously we're gonna get the restoration out of the speed fire and we're gonna go through the polishing process that we did and we have to try it in to make sure we like our margins and that we like our contacts. 
If we, uh, you know, and, and once it, they, these, ten, these restorations, honestly, they just tend to drop right in. Uh, that's what I love about the zirconia. The margins are exquisite. The contacts tend to be great. So at that point, the patient's saliva has ca contaminated the inside of that. And we need to be able to remove those salivary proteins or we're going to get basically zero bond strength with these. So what are the ways that we can remove those salivary proteins, those salivary phosphates, those contaminants uh, inside that crown? We can use alcohol. So you can uh, scrub it with alcohol. You can use a 5% bleach solution and, and get on the inside of that with, with bleach. You can sandblast the restoration, or you can use Ivoclean from Ivoclar, which tends to be a popular, uh, a popular choice. The one thing you absolutely don't want to do is never use phosphoric acid after, you're, uh, after you try it in. When we are trying it in, this, this uh, saliva basically goes in and starts going to those areas the, and bonding to where you sandblast your restoration. Now, if you throw in the phosphoric acid, the phosphates from that group tend to compete also and, and tend to plug up all those areas. Now we have a cement that wants to find all of the same areas that are taken up by the salivary proteins and by the, uh, the phosphoric acid uh, rinse, you're going to have literally zero, well, I shouldn't say literally, but almost zero bond strength with that. So be sure that you're removing that and uh, or you're gonna have a definitive issue with uh, your restorations not chemically bonding to, to there. Um, the, uh, if, you're, uh, if your zirconia, um, if your cement that you're using does not have a zirconia primer in it, you, I would recommend using a zirconia primer in the intaglio of the restoration. Things like Unisem 2, uh, like they, those have uh, zirconia. You don't need to, it's not necessary when you're using those, those types of cements. I also now wanna talk about the fact of when you're using resin modified glass ionomer, the cleanup is actually really easy. That's one of the wonders of, of using it and why so many people want to, to kind of fall back to doing that aspect of final cementation rather than, than uh, bonding, adhesively bonding them in. So I wanna talk about a few little tips and tricks that if you do have to use Unisem, what you can do to make placing or, or removing the cement a little bit easier. I'm, I'm one of these people that I'm very systematic in how I prep. I have a, a series of burrs that I use in the same line every time. Uh, when I design my restorations, I have a design sequence that I use, the same uh, uh, tools to design. And when I'm, when I'm placing my uh, cemented restorations in, I clean up my restorations pretty much the same way. So the first thing I do is I use a floss actually made by Johnson & Johnson it's called Total Care here, you can see it. And the reason that I love it is because it's, it's this rubber-based floss, so it does not kind of shear into tiny little threads, which end up getting a lot of times stuck in the patients in between their teeth, and you see them like picking at it with their tongue <clears throat> or driving their, they just drive themselves a little bit crazy. So I just like the fact that this doesn't go through, it just tears and it's done. But the other thing I like it for is, I take a piece of articulating paper and I'll just fold it over the floss and I'll run it down the floss. Actually, my assistants, they do this for me and it's lied out on the tray just like this. So I have the uh, articulating paper, the, I have it, the ink basically on my floss ready to go. So you'll see a, um, an image of a, an Emacs crown that was done from one of my previous presentations that I did just because I had it in there. And you'll notice, I floss, when I floss through, it makes marks exactly where the restoration is binding, and I know exactly where to adjust. So if your zirconia crown comes out of the speed fire, and you go to try it in, and it's just a little bit too tight, don't arbitrarily just start taking off those marks and not knowing exactly where that contact is. Using a tip like this will make it very accurate in where it's getting held up and where you need to reduce. So that thing will, those restorations will drop and you're not gonna worry about possibly opening up your contact in another spot in within the, within the adjacent, you know, where how they're touching adjacently. The other thing I use a lot is uh, from Parkell. It's a, it's a separating medium called BlueSep. And, and I really like BlueSep because one of the issues that we have when we're bonding in these restorations is that the, the material not only goes uh, down 
into the gum tissue and things like that, but it comes up through the contact a lot and almost up over the marginal ridges. So next thing you know, you have your adhesive cement that is now stuck to both the adjacent tooth your, the interproximal of your restoration and you just can't get a floss or anything through there. So I like to paint the, the restoration on the interproximal along the interproximal wall of the, the restoration I'm doing and also the interproximal of that adjacent wall. So I would do it on, if this was a, a, say number 30, I would do it on the distal wall of number 29, I'd do it on the mesial wall of 31 and then I would go ahead and I'd put it on the interproximals here. What that's going to do is it's a separating medium unlike something like Vaseline or KY or things that people use as a separating medium, it's got a color to it. And it's very, it's gel-like when it comes out. And then when you place it on, it almost gets tacky, so it doesn't run. So the big thing you wanna make sure, I don't wanna get my blue sep, which is a separating medium, underneath the margin, because then I'm gonna have a, a potential for a debond. I just wanna place it in all aspects of that interproximal so when the cement comes in contact, it will just flick right off. And it makes cleanup so much easier for you. The other thing that I recommend highly using are by the Butler Gum Company, the soft picks. I don't know if you use these. Uh, we give them out to our hygiene patients all the time for patients who don't like to floss, which who doesn't like to floss? Everybody likes to floss, right? So in this case, for those that don't, those one or two people in your practice, we hand these out. But for us, I find that I use it the most for interproximal cement cleanup. I make sure I'll, I'll tack cure my, my cement. I'll clean off all the perimeter. I'll make sure that there's no unset cement on the underside. And I'm gonna hold my restoration down very firmly. And I'm going to push my soft pick through the interproximal between the contact and the gum tissue and those little kind of like Christmas tree branches that are on these things, they just grab cement and they push it right out of the lingual. So I'll tend to pack a cord and I'll leave a cord packed in when I seat the restoration down. And then I'll uh, put the blue sep on the adjacent teeth and then I'll seat the restoration down uh, with the cement and I'll tack cure it. And then you'll see here, in this case, I took my finger off so I could take a picture without my thumb in it. But you'll see, my thumb was down and I started to push this through and you can see all of the cement that gets stuck within that soft pick. You see, I packed cord. And why did I do that? Well, it's gonna stop your cement from getting subgingival. So all I do is I get through there, I tack cure it again for about five seconds just to make sure that the cement is nice and set. Pull out my cord put a little glycerin on the buccal and lingual walls of that restoration, and then go ahead and do your final cure. And then everything should come off really nice and you have these beautiful margins that will you know, avoid the oxygen inhibited layer. If for some reason you get something stuck in between, then you can use what uh, the contact ease. These things are wonderful. There's a lot of different companies that make these saws. They have the Sarasaw and things like that. I like these because my fingers fit nicely on there. You can you have a lot of control going back and forth, and they have ones with serrated edges like these. They also are great for like interproximal reduction, or if you have a little piece of cement adhered, you can kind of follow it like a C shape and get below and and remove any residual cement. So they're they're a wonderful. Uh, addition to your, your cleanup in your armamentarium. So with that, um, I hope that working through this gives you some ideas of how, why we wanna use zirconia, uh, how to handle it in your practice, how to get it into the oven, get it out of the oven, uh, how to pre-polish and then do your final polishing, and then how to make sure that making the cleanup, which can be um, some of the most frustrating part of what we do, a little bit easier for you on your day-to-day -day practice. Uh, having the, the, the ability to do chair-side zirconia in my practice is something that's very, very wonderful for us. It allows us to use um, a really wide armamentarium in our practice that allows us to do chair side dentistry same day. And I gotta tell you, my patients love the chair side dentistry aspect of this much more than I do. So with that, I hope these tips and tricks help you back on Monday morning and I appreciate you taking the time to listen. Thank you very much.